So we are so excited uh, to uh, speak today uh, and actually hear amazing news from our own educator, we're so proud, from Philadelphia, uh, Rabbits and Mrs. Alisa Ben Shalom. And uh, our own Safia will guide us and help us on this journey of conversation. Uh, why and where and how? Once again, uh, it's such a pleasure. So Alisa, please, you know, share your story with us. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Sophia, also for having me and for connecting. Do you want me to jump right in or is there any, is there a specific question you want to start with? No, I'm, I will just tell you that we have a group of Russian American Jews who are very excited uh, about uh, making Aliyah right now. So we are actively prepping, mapping out to different communities, uh, learning Hebrew every Sunday, Monday and Tuesday now. <laughs> Uh, so we are actually um, uh, making it happen that the Shana Chaba Shalim is really something that we mean. And Amen. <laughs> I love that. It's, uh, and we need a lot of guidance and advice and tips and tricks because uh, we want to okay. go to Israel with uh, our eyes open and uh, make it a lasting uh, um, lasting prospect for us. It would be good to hear from you uh, some inspiration and also uh, some tips and tricks and uh, um, yeah, a little bit about your journey. Okay, beautiful. First of all, I'm so excited to be here. I am from Rage Philly and I've been working with students over the last year and I fell in love with Rage. I, there was Hashkafa Pratit, it was divine inter intervention that I got connected with Rage. And when I met all of the students and the rabbis and the whole community, I was like, oh my gosh, I love everybody. <laughs> I have such a connection. And they're like, are you Russian? And I was like, listen, by your standards, I'm not Russian, you know? But if you go back on both of my family's side, the roots are Russian. <laughs> and so I do have Russian roots although it's not you know I'm not like first generation second generation it's more like third or fourth generation but it must be there because I just have this warm spot in my heart for Russian Jews I, I love them <laughs> you're an honorary member <laughs> thank you thank you I accept I only learned a few words in Russian I don't know so much but but enough to say you know and and to to greet everybody so, hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Aliza Ben Shalom. I live in Philadelphia right now, and Bezrat Hashem, in 10 days, I'm going to be able to say, I live in Israel. Please, God. <laughs> we are very much hoping that the airport opens, that they allow enough travelers. We just got news that uh, maybe 2,000 people a day they're going to allow in. And so things are changing right now. Um, but let me take a step backwards. We're going to go back in time, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and share. So I fell in love with Israel. It was like this. It was like a match made in heaven. When I was 17, I went on a trip with a bunch of uh, young high school students and we went with our leaders and they took us all around Israel and I saw everything and I heard everything and I just felt very much at home. And it's so weird because I didn't speak Hebrew at the time. I got, you know, a little Jewish education, Hebrew school, whatever I knew. I, I didn't know much to be so comfortable. It wasn't like I had Israeli parents. I just landed and I just went, oh, I am home. This is my home. I have to come back here. And I don't know how, when, when, and I don't know how I'm going to come back but I am coming back and I'm gonna make this happen. And that started when I was 17. And since then, every couple of years, I've tried to make a trip to go. And sometimes there's a larger gap in time between those trips. And sometimes there was a smaller gap in time. And then in my early twenties, when I was 22 after college, Everybody said, great, what are you going to do? You graduated college. Now what are you going to do? And I was like, I want to go learn in Israel. I want to go to Israel. So I finally went to Israel. I did a wonderful program. It was a seven-month program. And it was in the middle of the desert in Arad, which is, if you know where Beersheba is, it's even further than that and cl very close to the Dead Sea, about 30 minutes outside of the Dead Sea. I was not in Jerusalem. I was not in Tel Aviv. I was in this tiny little nothing town, which is a dot on the map. And it was so wonderful. And, and as much as I fell in love with Israel the first time, I fell in love again. And I started doing an ulpan and I started learning. And I thought 
about living in Israel. And they started to teach me about the banking and what to do. And if you make Aliyah and getting a job and I, and I had like my head looking like, oh, could I do that? And then I was like, no, there's no way. Like, I, I, gotta, I gotta go back to America. I, I can't make this happen. And so I had my heart very much rooted in Israel. It was like a seed that was planted in the ground that couldn't fully sprout. And I had my head in a place where I just had to come back to America. So I came back and I've been doing a little bit of a dance, but I knew when I was looking for my soulmate, when I was dating, that making Aliyah and moving to Israel was a number one priority to me. So whomever I dated, I talked about Israel and, oh, do you have plans to go? And if we would go, and I would always talk about it. And when I met my husband, we started to talk about it. And we were talking about a lot of things and we were getting close to engagement. And we talked about Aliyah and he said, yes, of course, Aliyah. And I was like, no, 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 no. Yes, of course. I need a plan. I'm a, I'm a plan person. I want to know, Tachlis, when are we going? And I was like, five years. We could be in America. After five years, we go. He's like, five years, we got to stay in America. We've got to earn money. We've got to, you know, there's a lot to do. 10 years. I'm like, 10 years, we're going to get stuck. We're never getting out. I said, all right, we'll meet in the middle. What, what does a good couple do? They compromise. We'll meet in the middle. Seven years. On or before our seventh wedding anniversary, let's make Aliyah. And we started to talk about it. We're here now, but we're going to Israel. We're here now, but we're going to Israel. And it was really upsetting to our friends and our family who very much loved us. And they said to us, look, just don't talk about it. We get it that you're going. Just don't talk about it. It's too painful to us. And close to year six, we started to have the reality of like, so are we going? We said on or before our seventh wedding anniversary, are we going? Are we going? And we considered it. We looked at our life. We looked at everything that we had. And we said, we can't go now. We can't go. Like we're already rooted here, family and kids. And, and we don't have enough money to do this. How are we going to do this? And, you know, we don't, we don't have enough of a plan in place. We didn't do Sophia, what you were doing. We didn't take Hebrew lessons. We didn't like, we weren't planting the right seeds. Mm -hmm. And so we put it on a permanent pause and we just said, okay, one day we're going to go when the Messiah comes, if America turns upside down, if, if things are no good, we're going to go. We're not going to go today, but one day we're going to go. And for many years, it sat there. First, I cried. I cried a lot. I just, it was a dream that was just shattered and broken. And then it just became the normal. We were just here. We were just in America and it was just what it was going to be. And in 2016, I went back on a women's mission and I went back to learn and I landed and I looked around and I went, I am home and we are coming home and we are making Aliyah. And I had this moment, this spark that I hadn't had in years. And I, and I said, came home from that Israel trip and I'm all excited. And I come and I tell my husband, I'm like, we're going to make Aliyah within three years. It's 2016 by 2019, we are making Aliyah. And I have a plan because you have to have a plan. Our kids and the ages and the schools and the grades and the high schools and the everything, right? <clears throat> I was working everything out and my husband looks at me and I'm talking and talking and talking. And after about three weeks, he's like, sweetheart, enough. We can't go. We can't go. We're not doing this. And I said, no, we have to go. This is like, we have to go. After three weeks, he said, we can't, we're not in the right position to do this. He said, but go as much as you want. <clears throat> Excuse me, go every year if you want. The next year I went again, I came back and for two weeks, I'm talking about it. We're making Aliyah, I have the plan. I know what we're doing, we're going. <laughs> After two weeks, he's like, sweetheart, it's, it's not our time, we're not going. And I was like, no, we have to go. We have to go. We have to go. The, the kids and the ages and the high school and the, it's, it's the moment. We have to go. We have to go. And he said, we can't go. It's not right. We can't go. In 2018, 20, wait, wait, I got to think back now. 20, last year was 2020. And I was supposed to, I didn't. 2019, we went, I went again, not we, I went. And before I went, he said, and when you come back, I don't want to hear about this Aliyah business. Go every year if you need to. But like, must speak. Bayenu, enough. We cannot talk about this. It's not our time. So I came back and I did my best to respect his wishes. So I talked to my high school kids. And I was like, aha, I have a plan. 
Abba said, we can't go now. But if you guys get in high school there, you could go to a boarding school. Do you know there's free boarding school that you could go to? And they teach you Hebrew and they give you an ulpan for 15, 20 hours a week, maybe 18 hours a week. They teach you everything you need to know. The school's called Naale. It's, it's the umbrella organization. There's like six different schools. You could go to any one of the schools, pick the school you like. Come on, let's look online. Look at the school. What school do you like? And so I introduced them to the different schools and we talked about it. One, one, my oldest son was like, okay. He's like, you know what? If we all make Aliyah, I'll go, but I'm not going to go alone. My daughter's like, nah, I could go without you. I'll go. And then two weeks later, they're like, you know what? Unless we're all going, we're not going. We don't, we don't, this is what you want, Ima. This is your dream. This is your vision. We're not going unless you're in. So I, I like everything kind of fell apart. And this was 2019. And, and I was getting ready to do forms in school. I had like started application. Cause like in the hopes that it could be, and then everything shattered. And I was like, fine, you know what? I made a deal with Hashem. I made a deal with God. Maybe you can make deals. Maybe you can't make deals, but we have a special relationship. We, we, it's like playing a game here. Like we, I'm going to do your will and you help me do my will. And we, we work together here. I said, you know what, Hashem, for so many years, I've wanted to make Aliyah, but I never put my money where my mouth was. I am going to sign up for Nefesh Benefesh. I'm gonna just start the application process. I'm gonna put in my name and where I live and my family and all the details that they want. I'm gonna put that in. And when they say, when do you wanna make Aliyah? I'm gonna write, I don't know. They give you, you know, one year, two to three years, five years, I don't know. They give you options. So I checked off the box that said, I don't know. Two days later, I get a phone call. Hello, Aliza? This is your Aliyah coordinator. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I just, I was like, I was just, this is just wishful thinking here, you know? When are you coming? In two years? And I was like, I mean, maybe three, five, ten, or never. I'm not sure. But she's like, okay, so two to three years? And I was like, okay, sure. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so what I want you to do is the apostille paperwork. I want you to get the special stamp of approval on certain paperwork. But don't do the FBI paperwork. That expires after six months. But the other stuff is good forever. If you do it now, even if you made Aliyah in 10 years, it would still be good. It's fine. It just has to be done once. I said, okay, great. I don't know. A couple of weeks later, they're calling back. So are you finished? Did you get started on your paperwork? <laughs> right? Meantime, I made the application for Nefesh Benefesh. I didn't do it with my husband. I didn't tell him. I didn't <laughs> ask him. There was no, there was no reason to, because nothing was happening. It was, it was, it was. If I put you know, my money where my mouth is, if I make an effort in this direction, will Hashem guide me in that direction? Will God lead me in the way that I want to go if I make my effort? And I couldn't get my kids there and I couldn't get myself there and I couldn't do anything, but an application was just online. I could just go to nefeshbenefesh.com and I could fill out some forms and, and I could be in their system recognized. Right. So Nowadays, my... you have to wait a long time to get a response to them because Nefesh Benefesh is overwhelmed. And now, they don't even call, <laughs> now they don't even call you back because they're so overwhelmed. If you don't make Aliyah, if you don't say within the next six months, they won't even call you. You're 100% right. So my husband, so a couple weeks later, like three weeks later, I kept this, you know, tight lipped for three weeks. Three weeks later, we're sitting at a Shabbos table and we're talking about life and Israel. And he's saying something like, well, one day we're going to make Aliyah. And I was like, oh. By the way, on the subject of Aliyah, we have a witness. He can't kill me while you're here. <laughs> you're about to witness something monumental, our dear friend. I said, uh, so sweetheart, I uh, made an application for Aliyah. And he goes, yeah, yeah, of course you did. I was like, no, no, no. I mean, I'm serious. Like I went on nefeshbenefesh.com and I applied for Aliyah. I put in an application. He's like, yeah, but it means nothing. I'm like, right, exactly. It's just paperwork. It's a, he said, did you check off the box that said, I didn't tell my husband that I made an application. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. So we joked about it and we laughed about it. And, it, and for all intents and purposes, if you never make Aliyah, but you go in and you try and you put paperwork in and you start the process, you're in their system. If one day you should make Aliyah, your, your paperwork will become activated. And if you don't, then you just started the process, but you just didn't finish it. A lot of people start the process, but they don't finish. So I put it there and I left it. And then it was 2020. And we were going to get passports because by the way, I have five kids. None of them had passports. And my husband's passport was expired. 
And I don't know if you know what happened in 2020, but when you put your passport in, instead of getting it back in six to eight weeks, you couldn't even get it back for six to eight months. It went to an office and it sat in an office and it did nothing because all of the offices were closed. So now I'm in a panic. Oh my gosh, I had all the time in the world. I never even did my paperwork and my documentation. Even if I want to go now, I can't even go. Yeah, the doors and are closing. <laughs> the doors are closing. It's like, like, like you want to get in, you want to get in, you want to get in. Like you can't, you can't get in. So we started calling everybody we knew. And I said, how do you quickly get a passport through? They said, there is no expediting purpose service. You can't even pay if you wanted to a uh, hundred or something per thing. You could even pay an extra thousand dollars to expedite the process. You can't. I said, we are the Jewish people. We must get to Israel. There must be a way around this. There must be somebody in this world that knows how to make something happen. So there is. And if anybody needs anything with American passports, you could contact me personally. And I will give you the name of somebody who helps people to find faster routes to get paperwork and things done actually so we, we do need that information <laughs> i am gonna i am gonna send you name and information so that you can give it to anybody who needs for anybody making aliyah students getting to israel whatever they needed to get people into israel passports were expedited within two weeks my husband had his passport and everything started to process it was insane and i didn't even have to pay the expediting fee which was like saved me. The pandemic saved me money in that way. And then we had other paperwork that we couldn't get or that we didn't have. And because the offices were closed or on very unusual circumstances, people actually picked up the phone. It like rang to their cell phone because nobody was in the office. So it, just, it was this bizarre turn of events where I was able to do things that I normally couldn't do through the regular system that I thought were going to slow down because of the pandemic that actually sped it up. So if anybody is in Philadelphia and has, um, you know, a Pennsylvania birth certificate, and then you need to get with an apostille, if you mail it in to the office, it just sits there. My friends, it sat there for four months, and then they finally just got it back. But if you drive to Harrisburg and you put it in the blue envelope in front of the office with the special address and the location, they'll get it back to you. If you put your, you know, you have to put a FedEx envelope with, you know, one day shipping and get it back to you it will come back to you within three to four days. So I figured out all of these things that needed to get done. And one by one with Nefesh Benefesh, you have your online portal, you log in every time. First of all, your information is secure. They send you a passcode, then the passcode has to go in every time you log in. So it's very secure. And then they give you a list. Oh, Aliza, Gershon, all of your kids. Okay, here's who needs what documentation. And when you upload the documentation, they either say approved, good, or mm -mm, something's wrong with that. So just for example, something that I didn't know, my name is on my birth certificate, but my parents' name was not. Your parents' name has to be on your birth certificate. So I had to order a new birth certificate and then the new birth certificate had to get the apostille. So just to give you an idea of like a little bit of the paperwork Balagan, which in Hebrew is a big mess. Um, there's a lot of different things to be done, but Nefesh Benefesh makes it easy in that they tell you, here's what you have, here's what you need, here's what you have, here's what you need. And then as you submit it, you hold everything in a file because that amazing file then goes to the Jewish agency. And I didn't want to send it in the mail. So I drove to New York and I went into the office and I handed them my thing and I stood there behind the glass waiting and he's checking all the paperwork and he goes, yep, 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 yep. Okay, everything's here. Okay, good. He gives it all back to me. I put it back in my bag. I took a two hour trip to stand there for 10 oh. minutes for him to check paperwork. Normally they'd sit down, they'd have a whole meeting, but with COVID everything is expedited and done um, through a lot of distance. So all of the paperwork started to process and um, things started to happen rapidly. So we made this decision on June 27th of 2020 that we were gonna make Aliyah. And we, please God, please God, we'll make Aliyah February 23rd, which is in nine days. All of the paperwork is complete. I just got, I, we had to get our passports with special stamps and paperwork in them. So even after they saw them, they have to go back to New York. So we just received that paperwork back and uh, we're just waiting to hear that the airways are open and that Israel is ready to receive us. And it's not just the seven of us. 
we got ourselves a pandemic puppy in April because we did not know we were making Aliyah. <laughs> and by the way, you can make Aliyah with your animal, but it is an extra expense. And um, it was a really big, um, really big surprise. So that was just, I was like, oh, paperwork is enough with seven people, but seven people and a dog, but whatever, we got through it. There is a vet in um, Center City, if you need that information, they know exactly what to do for Aliyah. They were the only vet in the whole area that I could find that knew exactly what to do. So, um, yeah, so that is a little bit about our story. I saw somebody popped a question like, what made your husband finally come around? Um, so I'll just answer that. The short answer is we always said when things were upside down, when we as Jews no longer felt safe in America, when we felt like these are the, this is like the coming of days, like the coming of the Messiah. Like it's so obvious that things are so different right now and that things are shifting. And I always told my husband, if we are locked out of Israel, if there's ever a point where you can't get in, I want to be locked in. I don't want to be locked out. And right now, even Israelis can't get in. The gates to Israel have been closed and they have to open them. And as soon as they open the airways and they open the borders, anybody who wants to get in should get in before they close them again, because something is happening and it's not time to stay where you are. It is time to go. When, when Jews can no longer freely come and go to Israel, my red flag goes up, my alert, my panic button goes off. I want, if you're gonna lock me anywhere, you lock me in that country, not out of that country. I saw in your feeds that you're planning on moving to Pardes Hana, yes. only spending like 30 minutes in that city and your husband has not even been there and you're moving your family of seven and your dog to this city. So what made you decide <laughs> to do that? <laughs> yes, it's such an interesting thing. So everybody, you have to make your list and you have to have your criteria. Where are you going? And what do you need to get out of a community? So I'll tell you what was on my priority list. Number one, do I know at least one person or one family that lives in that community that I know, that I like, that I connect to, okay? For me and for my husband, do we know at least one family there? So the answer is yes. We knew actually only one family that is in the community. And, and that was one criteria. Another criteria for us was that we needed to have um, good schools and, and school options in alignment with our views of, of what we define as a good school and what we want for our children. So we found a lot of different options and beautiful educational options in the community. And that was something that was important to us. For us, we said we do not want to live in a city like a, like a major city like Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or in one of the hot spots. So we were looking to either go north or go south. When you go north or south, usually the communities are a little bit more affordable. The housing is more affordable. Um, it's usually a little bit warmer, more engaging. You're not just lost in a sea of people in a city. You're actually embraced within a community. And so that was something that was important to us. Um, we wanted a place that was beautiful, that, um, which all of Israel is beautiful in its own way, um, but that looked beautiful to us. And we also found that this is a community, um, there's artists and musicians, and it was just, it was a diverse, eclectic community. There's secular people in the community, there's religious people. Like when I tell my religious friends, we're moving to Pardes Khan, they're like, wow, so interesting. Oh, I had no friends there. It's wonderful. When I tell my secular friends, like, oh, that's amazing. I, I love Pardes Khan, I know friends there. It didn't matter who we told. It was this very open, embracing community. And that was something to me that I thought was unique and really special about it as well because sometimes you move to a community and it's all secular or it's all religious uh, but this was something that encompassed you know encompass, encompassed both of those things so um that was also really special so yeah i was there once for 30 minutes before i was on my way to visit my one friend who lives in that city she brought me over hi how are you oh here's my house weigh your suitcases make sure they're not too heavy for the airport okay great let's get in the car and go and it was like dusk so <laughs> i looked around i saw you know a few palm trees and a beautiful area, but not much. It's not like we, we didn't drive around. We literally drove to her house and then we drove to the airport and my husband has never been there. And so we are moving to a place that we've never been to. We've seen lots of photos of it online. 
tons of photos from our friends who have sent us things. Pardes Chana, Chana is a name and Pardes means an orchard. So it is actually surrounded by beautiful orchards. Um, it's about 15 minutes from the beach, yay. It's, you know, there's like beautiful forest on one end. So it's a really beautiful, beautiful town. And we did tons of research online and, and we're able to explore it virtually because there's, there are no pilot trips. Like this is it, just go. You could rent a place and we're planning to go and rent a place if it wouldn't be our community for any reason. We're not buying a house, we're just renting a house and we can, that'll be our pilot moment, but it'll be our pilot Aliyah, not a pilot trip. Wow, <laughs> you have a lot of Amuna to make that decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I saw, and, uh, you have been already packing up your house two weeks before you're moving. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, how did that go with, uh, with shipping okay. everything and um, yeah, making it happen and uh, surviving without everything? <laughs> so interesting. So the advice I could give you with packing is even now, if you're going in a year, two years, three years, whenever it is, look around your house. And I always ask myself, I look at something and I'm like, Does this bring me joy? Do I need this? Like Marie Kondo, she's like, does this bring me joy? So I don't ask, does this bring me joy? I ask, am I making Aliyah with this? Am I schlepping this to Israel? Am I paying to bring this? Yes? Okay, it stays. No, donate, trash, give it to a friend. And I would just constantly look at it and go, is it worth shipping to Israel? Am I really bringing this with me? And if the answer was yes, I kept it. And if no, it started to go out. And then about a couple months ago, when we really got serious about this process, we went room by room. So first thing you could do is organize things. Like if you want to grab all the books and throw them on the bookshelf, instead of leaving a few in every room, then you can sort through the books and take the ones out that you don't really want. Um, and then we started to label things in the house. And if it had a red sticker on it, it told the movers, don't touch it. It's, it's here, we're leaving it. It's better to get everything out before, but we couldn't go through everything, everything. So there were some things that we put red tape on, which just meant don't touch this and everything else in the house, they packed and they come in, in two days. They look at everything, they stick it all in boxes and then they take all the boxes and they shove it all in a truck. And they, from floor to ceiling, fill a truck. And based on the size of your house and how many things you're bringing, they tell you if you need a half a container, a whole container, or the extra large container to bring everything. So our truck was filled floor to ceiling and side, wall to wall. And I think there was like, you know, you, you could have fit, my husband says, like one more chair up top. That was about it. Every other inch of it was actually packed with everything. Um, and I'll tell you, Some people, Israeli beds are different than American ones. So if you bring your American beds, you have to bring sheets because Israeli beds are different sizes. And we made a decision. We are going to bring the beds. We're bringing the sheets and everything. But we got rid of all of our box springs. So we have double mattresses. So we have a mattress on top of a mattress. And that way, if we have guests, we just slide one off and poof, we have two beds. So we don't have to have a box spring. So that's like a little, a little hack. It's like, oh, how do you make <laughs> more space in an Israeli apartment that's tiny when you don't have enough space? So that was one of our little hacks. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a process. I have a question for you. Uh, what about your plans in Israel about your personal plans because we would love you to continue raging in Israel what about it I okay I told you I fell in love with rage when I say fell in love it was like Bashar love like I love rage and I love Russians <laughs> I hope it's not offensive to say it I have <laughs> Russian heritage but I I also I was in rage Chicago when we did a Shabbaton we had the best time when I say the best time I'm still in touch with a whole bunch of people from the Shabbaton because we connected on a real heart and soul level because Russians are real you say it like it is you speak you're straightforward you don't hold anything back and you make deep meaningful connections and I love that that's really it's all about you so by the way we don't we don't exclude um, American Jews and Israelis and every everyone is welcome right. but of course we would love to First of all, have someone who will welcome us when we come with our groups to Israel. Yes. We would love also to reach out to uh, young Russian background students from Tel Aviv University, from Haifa Technion, uh, yes. that they may feel com complain that they, no one is reaching out to them. So we'd love to yes. work together with you. So yes. we're going to be in touch. I would love so to. Excited. 
We're so oh, fun. I would absolutely love to. And and for any chizuk, for a group like this right. to come on and to speak and to tell you, okay, here's what I learned when I landed. Oh, you need this. You need to know that. There's a lot of little details that we're still figuring things out. We got a call from the house that we're renting and the person that's there. He said, I just want you to know there's this thing with the gas. You have to pay this man and he comes and then he fills something and does something. And if you don't know it, you might think that it's it, but it's the way that we do it in Israel. I said, just tell me everything I need to know. Give me all the phone numbers I need to know. <laughs> Teach me your ways. And and I would always say also to expect the unexpected. Try to have financial reserves for, oops, I didn't know I needed that. And that cost another $200 or $300 or whatever it is. Because there's little nuances of details that, that we just don't know about until we come across them. So we're so inspired to see you inspired. I was so inspired to see that. You're so I, inspired. I can't believe it. Yeah, well, it's yeah. been, this has been a dream. So I, when I told you, when I went when I was 17, I fell in love. I went back at 22 and I thought, I love this place, but I can't live here. How am I going to live here? I don't have my family here. I don't like, how am I actually going to make this happen? And I want to do it, but I have my family at home. And, and then I kept going and I would go on and off for years. And every time I left, I would cry. I was a mess. I would sit on the plane like this bawling and and everybody's like are you okay you need tissues and i'm like yeah I'm fine i just don't want to leave but i have to leave and, and i was just so 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 emotional about it i would come back and i would be a little to be honest depressed every time i came back because it wasn't where i wanted to be it wasn't where i belonged i knew that i belonged there it just was never it has to be the right person, the right time, the right land, the right time and it wasn't my time but it was painful every single time i left and then this came about where we had this aha moment. You know what? The left is right and up is down and the world is in a very unusual circumstance. We're getting locked out. If we don't go now, we might not get in. We must go. We must make plans to go. And our children, my oldest was in 11th grade in America. Here's another little hack. When he went to Na'ale, they said, does he speak Hebrew? I said, no, he could read it, but he doesn't speak Hebrew. They said he has to go back to 10th grade because we need three years to teach him Hebrew. We'll get him fluent in three years, but we don't do it in two. We need three years. So I told him, you got to go back to 10th grade. And he's like, I'm not going back to 10th grade. And I was like, no, no, you, you have to. It's not, it has nothing to do. It just, they can't teach it to you in two years. They, they start the program 10th, 11th, 12th. That's what they do. So he said, um, after a little while of talking and convincing and, you know, sharing of why, he finally agreed. He is so happy there right now. He is having the time of his life with other students from all across the globe because they bring students to these programs from all over the world. He is having such a wonderful time. I'm like, yeah, and you got three years of this. You know, you have all of high school to enjoy. And, and it's such a blessing. So there's all these little things where if, and if we didn't go right now, he would have missed that moment. Had we gone next year, he would have been in 12th grade already. He would have been too old. So he, my big kids had to go before us, um, but they knew that it was only going to be a couple of months, but they left October 19th and they've been in Israel for four months without us. So um, it just, you have to go in the right time, but if you have that desire and if you have that need, just start to make plans, start learning your Hebrew upon, take it now. It's amazing. Get your Hebrew, brush yourself up and get it, you know, dust off the Hebrew or learn something. If you don't know it, I started to do Hebrew with a tutor. Um, and I learned that I, I need a larger vocabulary. I am so frustrated because I cannot say anything fast enough and, and it's going to be difficult, but I'll get it. And, and the other thing is party Hana, where we're moving is not an English American bubble, right? So there's some communities that are an American bubble. You could go there, there's tons of Americans, there's hardly any Israelis, and you could feel very much like you're living in America, but you happen to be living in Israel. In Pardes Hana, it's actually an Israeli community, and there are American hubs throughout the community where there's not American, Anglos. Anglo just means English speaking from any country. And so there's Anglos from all over. And so for us, I said, that's where I want to be. I want to be in a place where I'm going to be forced to learn Hebrew because the community is going to be more of an Israeli community. I want to feel like I'm in Israel. I don't want to feel like I'm in a little mini America. I, did, I, I don't need America. I need Israel. So I was also looking for a community that felt like that. And we'll have to see, you know, we're, we are American and we are not Israeli. And if you ask my Hebrew, does, my husband, do you speak Hebrew? He's like, no, 
You know, I'm like, no, I do not. That, that's his standard answer. He goes, listen, I'm going to be like the grandpa of the com community. They're going to come over and they're going to all talk English to me because I'm not learning Hebrew. I said, you're going to learn it because you're going to be in party sana and you're just, you're going to, it's going to be comfortable because they're going to try to speak to you in Hebrew and it's going to be that type of community. So we really wanted that. We wanted to integrate into Israel. But if you want a soft landing and you want to integrate into an American or English speaking or Anglo or Russian community, that exists also. And you just do your research to find, go look north, look south, look all over in the different communities and see where your community is. And you'll find it. It just takes, takes a little bit of effort. So I think um, you inspire us. Yes, yes, Sophia, please. Well, as uh, we know, you are also a Jewish dating guru and we have a uh, Russian and American singles in our group uh, that are um, that want to make Aliyah and also looking for their soulmate. What do you recommend for them to do? Um, do you recommend to make Aliyah first and then uh, you know uh, find your place and home in Israel, or uh, you don't want to postpone that uh, search for the soulmate? What is the best approach in that situation? Okay, so. Okay, so the best plan, if you want to make Aliyah and you want to live there, and that's a really big, important dream, 100% put all of your efforts into making Aliyah, go in that direction. And at the same time, if somebody amazing comes up in your life here, you could, of course, date them, but let them know, right? But I'm making Aliyah, so we're making Aliyah. This is our plans. This is where we're going. If you don't care, if you're either way, like, oh, I could make Aliyah or not. If I find my soulmate, I could say, okay, fine. But if you want to make Aliyah, don't marry a person who doesn't want to do that because you'll never get there and you're, you'll are you have to let go of your dream, which is okay. You could do that and, and stay with your soulmate, but you'd have to make a really big decision. If you're worried, how am I going to find my soulmate in Israel? You're in Israel. You're in the land of the Jews. You are in the place where there is the greatest possibility to meet your soulmate. And there are Jews from all over the entire world there. So I have no doubt that if you go there that you will be able to find them. You don't need to stay where you are to find your person. Absolutely, you can go there. There's an adjustment period and things take time and you'll have to get used to it. But for sure, you can absolutely go there and find your soulmate. If that is something that's important to you, get on the plane as soon as you can go, pack up your stuff. And, uh, and figure it out. Parnassa, um, earning an income and a living is usually one of the more difficult things. Soulmate, we can find you anywhere. I'm not worried about the soulmate piece of it. So we'll keep you a, a number on hand uh, for the- 100%, 100%, yeah, absolutely. And I'll be there, so I'll be keeping my eyes out for everybody. I'll be like, oh, wait, who do I know? Wait, what's your background? <laughs> you know, Who are you looking for? Hold on, I have somebody. Oh, there is a question here. Uh, if you have any tips for single parents, um, you know, making Aliyah. Yeah, so I love the idea of either going together with another, you know, person, another family or, or somebody within your community or trying to find somebody like a friend of a friend of a friend that you know somewhere that lives in a community so that when you land, you're not alone. It's really important that when we land, we like everybody in Israel will welcome you in. It's a very warm and welcoming place. However, we have to do our best to set ourselves up for success. So even us, we have a family and there's seven of us and there's a dog. But if I move to a city where I know nobody, it's gonna be a challenge. So this one friend that we know in this community, they reached out to the landlord of the place that we're renting. They went there to help get us the documentation so that we could get it signed. I mean, they, there were so many nuances and details that we needed a little bit of support with. And they were able to do that. We did it on our own. You could go with a realtor. By the way, there's um, a realtor that is very well known. Her name is Kim Bash. And she knows all the different communities. She does tours of all the different communities. She helps people find homes. She's phenomenal. And um, if you're going through an agent or you have somebody, then you'll get the support from them. We, we had direct contact with the landlord, which was something also it was divine intervention, how that came about. It was a friend of one of my singles who said, you're moving to Pardes Hana. I have friends there. I'll put you guys in a WhatsApp group. You can talk. And we started talking and they were like, well, what do you need? And we're like, we need a place to live. And they're like, okay, let me put it out on my men's group. Let me see if anybody knows of anything. And they put it out there and it happened. And so it was, it was a tremendous blessing of, you know, the way that it happened. So um, I would advise you to find a friend who wants to make Aliyah with you, do it together or find somebody through friends of friends and make that contact in Israel, just so that it makes the landing a little bit smoother so that you at least have somebody when you go. Thank you. 
we have any more questions in the group, you can raise your hand or post in the chat. And there's gonna, I'll just say while we're waiting for questions to come in, there's gonna to be tons of obstacles. So if I would have made Aliyah two years ago, three, five, 10 years ago, there would have been challenges, right? But today making Aliyah, like right now, you can't even get a hold of Nefesh Benefesh to get your preliminary questions answered unless you're making Aliyah within six months. They're not picking up the phone and they're not assigning coordinators because they're so inundated with people. So there's always going to be challenges when you try to do something that is so important in this world. There's the highest level, the greatest good that we can achieve that we can do. There's always something that comes in, the Yetzirah, this evil inclination or this thing that comes to stop you. And it's gonna be strong. There's always gonna be a roadblock, you know, like, oh, Elisa, you can't get your passports. I could have given up before I even started. Oh, you got your passports but you also need this other documentation. Oh, you can't get that, the office is closed. I could have stopped, but I kept making phone calls. I kept trying to find ways around things to do things. Oh, my kids, they needed a, an ID. Oh, because my kids are, the bit two big kids are over 14, they also have to get FBI fingerprinted to check them and do a background check. But they needed an ID card to get the fingerprint. But the ID card location was closed. And then I had to provide a social security card to get the ID card to get the fingerprint. It was like three <laughs> steps to get one thing done. And every office was closed. And I just kept going backwards to find out where I had to go, what I had to get, and how to make it happen. And, you know, the, again, Hashem opened up doors and miracles happened. And the social security you know, office got our paperwork and somehow it miraculously got through quickly. They gave us special documentation temporarily. We went to the, you know, driving location just to get the ID because it wasn't a license and they were closed. And then the next day we went back and, and then we had to stand in line for 45 minutes. It was like all of these things. But if you take it one step at a time, and if you think about it, I did it with seven people, two adults, five kids and documentation and paperwork and plane fare for a dog. So <laughs> if we can do it with seven and a half of us and pulled it together in eight months during a pandemic, so you can do it. You can, there's yeah, nothing where to there's, complain with, about. <laughs> with where there's a will, there's a way. And all I have to say is when somebody tells you no, it just means they can't help you. It doesn't mean it can't be done. Anything, not anything, but almost anything could be done especially if you have a really strong will, it just means the person you're talking to doesn't know how to help you. Call somebody else. And if you get somebody on the phone from that office that can't help you, ask for a supervisor. Ask for somebody else in the office. There's, oh, I'm, I'm so creative about how to get what I want when I want it that I keep searching until I find the answers that I need or I find the people that I think that can support me. And, and it takes a strong will to make this happen and you just keep pursuing it and, and it will become a reality. I, I, at a certain point, I did turn everything over to God, to Hashem. And I said, you know what? This is on you. I want this more than anything in the world. I made my Nefesh Benefesh application. My husband's not on board. My kids aren't on board. I'm the only one that's on board. And if it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, but I want it to happen more than anything in the world. And I set my intention and I made the only efforts that I could make. And then God had to meet me in the, down the road and he had to help me that everybody was gonna be okay to be on board with this and talk about it, talk about it a lot. So it's not a surprise. Like for my kids, this isn't a, what my kids told me at one point, my big kids, they're like, well, we knew you were talking about it, but like, it wasn't a reality. Like we didn't think you, we didn't think you were actually going to do it. We, you know what I mean? You've been talking about it for a lot of years. I said, I know I was trying to manifest it. And Hashem said, no, but just because he said, no, didn't mean that I wasn't trying. They said, yeah, but we didn't exactly believe it was going to happen. I said, but I did give you a heads up and I did give you a lot of warning. And we talked about it a lot. So it wasn't a shock. Like they had never heard the idea. Of course they had heard the idea. They understood the concept. They knew the desire and the drive that I had. They just thought I wasn't going to be able to pull it off. And to be honest, I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull it off. So as long as you talk about it, it won't be a shocker to everybody's system. It'll be a hope. It'll be a wish. It'll be a dream. And some hopes and wishes and dreams come true and others stay hopes and wishes and dreams and they don't come true as quickly, but you still have to long for it. You can't give it up. Um, I got some questions on WhatsApp. Um, 
how did your parents react and was there any opposition from your parents or children? Yeah, so uh, from the parents, they are devastated. It is the hardest, most awful thing that we could do is to take our family and their beloved grandchildren and children away from them. And for us personally, it is the most difficult part of the entire process. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, we sat together, my husband and I, we talked about this, we made our decision. And then we said, we have to tell the parents and we couldn't tell them right away. Like we, we waited a couple days slash a week until we had to say something. And then we said something and it was excruciatingly painful. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, not going to pretend like it's anything else. And if you, I said to them recently, like, do you want to see the video? The truck came. Do you want to see the house? It's empty. There's echoes in the house. Now, like, no, 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 can't see it. Can't see it. Can't see it. So um, that is, I would say hard paperwork, nothing compared to that. Nothing, nothing, nothing compared to that. Um, getting my children on board or talking to them about it. Uh, my youngest is seven, my oldest is 17, and we were able to have conversations. We've been having conversations for years, but with the parents, it's heartbreaking. So we started doing a lot of Zoom phone calls. Right now it's COVID anyway, so we've been not able to see them as much as we you know, normally would like to. So we've been doing Zoom and phone calls and WhatsApp and, and videos, and we've been in touch consistently and trying really, really hard to stay in touch and connect. But uh, out of the whole process, that's the most painful part. There's no way around it. There is no way around it. I remember, by the way, similar situation when the 70s or 80s, when children were living and some parents were staying. But at the end, many parents moved as well. Is it a possibility for your parents? You know, it's such a good question. We have said, you know, our home is open. We brought 14 mattresses. So there's seven of us. So we have seven <laughs> mattresses and then seven mattresses under instead of box springs. So we have enough room for 14 <laughs> people to come and sleep in the house, even if they're in the living room piled on one another. We said where there's room in the heart, there's room in the home. And we have asked them to please, please, please consider coming. Um, there's... You know, right now there's a lot of concern with COVID and, and you know, that that is one challenge. Um, we hope and pray that they will come, that they will visit, and perhaps they will consider to stay six months out of the year, three months out of the year, something so that we can enjoy each other's company. We pray very much for that. It's, it, if you ask them directly, the answer is no. But one yet. side maybe will come visit, not yet. I mean, their answer is no. Their answer is not, not yet. Their answer is no. <laughs> but um, one side said, we'll come visit. The other side said, we might never get on a plane. You have to come back and visit us. So we said, look, they also said to us, why don't you go to Israel for the summers, enjoy Israel, stay there for the summers and live here during the year. I said, we're going to do the reverse. We're going to go live there during the year. We could come back here for the summers. We could visit for the summers. That's what would work for us. Um, with COVID and travel and everything right now, I don't know how much we're going to be able to travel. It's going to be a little complicated, but the hope is that there will be a, a new normal that might allow us to fly a little more easily and frequently so that we could come visit family. Wonderful. Sophia, do you want to uh, experiment or innovate? Do you want to allow any questions or just text? Um, yes, please so raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, I think, hi, I had a question. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. Hiya. Uh, well, I can read it out loud. For a retired single person, should we look for a community that has singles or will there be another way to connect? For a retired single person, I would say look for communities that have singles. I know that Netanya is a community that has um, retired singles in it. Um, that's just one of many places, but I would look for a community that has like-minded people. They're going to have, you know, game night and activity center and, you know, you know, hummantash and baking and all sorts of activities that you do together. And if you move to a community that has people that are 
um, like-minded your age and, and looking to live a similar lifestyle, that's going to be best for you. You'll have the most option for activities and community and connection with a lot of singles. And um, in terms of Pades Hana, there are two questions regarding Ulpanim, if there are, uh, or if you have to travel to a different city to get an Ulpan, and how were you able to sign up your children for school uh, without being able to visit and check out the schools in person? Yes, it's so interesting. So there are Ulpans in the city. Um, Pardes Khan is actually a large city. There's like 40,000 people in the whole uh, entire community. We're going to live in one of the, you know, little sub city, you know, sub communities within Pardes Khan. Um, but there are Ulpanim there. I don't know because of COVID. I think right now most of the things are online, unfortunately. So the way that you're learning right now online is just as good as I'm going to get in Israel as you get out of Israel. Uh, but I hope Bezrat Hashem that we can be in person. And for the schools, I this one friend that in this family that we know, I asked the wife about schools for children, and she said, you know, let me give you a few examples of what the different schools are, what they offer. And I told her what I was looking for. And we decided based on what I wanted and what she knew of the schools that this one location would be the best for us. And she got me in contact with the principal there. And I called them and I said, hi, we're making Aliyah and we're coming and I have three boys and we want to bring them to your school. And she said, wonderful. I said, do you have room? She said, let me see, let me register, let me see. And so they put us into the system. So um, in theory, we are sort of registered, but you don't, I mean, you get, there's like a place available for us, but you don't actually get fully, fully registered once you actually land and you are a new Olim. So we are waiting for that. And uh, we actually, we have to go, go into Israel, quarantine for two weeks. And then also we need our lift to arrive so that we can move into the house with, you know, actual furniture instead of sleeping on the floors. So um, it's a little bit of a process, but yes, we found a school that was good for them. And you might have to land and say, okay, we don't know what school and we're going to check out all the schools when we get there. And then I'll register once I get there. It's a, some people like to come in the summer for that reason. So you could check things out and then start the school year in the fall. We didn't want to wait because our big kids were going in October. We wanted to come as soon as possible and just get kids integrated this year with school, in school, out of school in America and everything. It was, we knew it was going to be a mess of a year. So we figured just go as soon as possible and make it happen. Um, there's another question regarding uh, anxiety and going through the whole back and forth within the family, within so many unknowns. And uh, is there some things that you would recommend to manage, uh, you know, this uh, um, anxiety level <laughs> of uh, anticipating, yeah. anticipating the trip, anticipating the move and uh, yeah. getting everybody on board? Yeah. yeah. So there's a great book and it's called Slowing Down to the Speed of Life. And it's by Richard Carlson. And it teaches you how to deal with what's at hand. So when everybody asks me, but how are you handling this, Eliza? You're supposed to leave in nine days. The airports aren't open. Do you still have tickets? What's happening, right? We are literally slowing down to the speed of life. I could tell you speed of life, L-I-F-E, life. Oh. <laughs> slowing down to the speed of life, okay? We are going at the pace of life. We have tickets for Tuesday, February 23rd. The airports are closed until February 21st. Things are supposed to open. What, happen if, what happens if they don't open? Okay, so we have plan B. Well, plan B is we're selling our house and we have to leave. So we need another location. So we have a backup potential location. Well, what if we get delayed by one week? Well, we have a, one location. Well, what if we get delayed by two weeks? Well, we have another location. Okay, well, what this, what that? Everything is resting on different decisions and we can only move one step at a time. And if I start to think about the entire process altogether, I'll have a nervous breakdown. Like, I, do I think I'm leaving? Do I not think I'm leaving? I don't know what's happening, maybe. Am I gonna get on that plane? Is the plane gonna fly? Well, if the plane's gonna fly, I'm gonna get on that plane. Is it gonna take off? I can't tell you. Is Israel gonna accept us? I, I don't know. We're, we're all in the middle of everything that's happening right now. Um, so we have plans to uh, close on our house a few days after we leave. So we're supposed to wrap up and move out. So we're gonna have to move out. We're selling our car. So we're gonna have no house. We're gonna have no car. And if we have no plane to get on, we need a plan a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, I need every letter of the alphabet to have a plan and you can only move 
as fast as life is moving. And so I'm trying to think ahead and be smart. And at the same time, I'm trying to plan for the unexpected. And at the same time, I'm wishful and hopeful that things are going to work out the way that I should want and desire that's the easiest for us, that makes sense. But if I think about everything all together, it might make my head swell and <laughs> might make me feel uncomfortable. So I try to break things down into individual steps. And I always ask, what do I need to know right now today? Like just for example, I knew I had to get on this call. So what did I need? I needed the link to get on this call, okay? I didn't have this link five days ago. I didn't need this link five days ago. When did I need this link? Five minutes before this call, I need this link so I could click it to get on. Would it be nice if you had it five days? Okay, maybe, but I don't need it then. So I only make decisions and I only handle right now what I need to handle right now immediately because I can't do anything different and because my hands are tied. If it was 10 years ago and we were talking about making Aliyah, could you have made plans in a different way? Would it have been more guaranteed that you'd get on a plane? Yeah, everybody was getting on planes before this. Israel wasn't closed, but now we're at a different speed and life is moving at a very unique speed. And this speed means we are not really making, like I'm making plans and I'm making Aliyah, but the borders are closed. All land and all air borders are closed today, today right? How are you going to go? That's not my problem to worry about. I have a ticket. Somebody else is going to figure that piece of the puzzle out. I only need to figure out my piece of the puzzle. My bag needs to be packed. I need to be able to go in a moment's notice. And you have to have your COVID test before, like there's all these things. And maybe you have to have a second COVID test if it gets delayed. So slowing down to the speed of life, only handling what you need to handle today and tomorrow you'll handle what you need to handle tomorrow. And don't think about it all at once or it'll make your head spin. And make lists if you need, hire an, a personal assistant. I do have for my business um, an assistant. And I said to her, I need your help. She's my you know, rock star office manager. I said, could you do me a favor? In addition to all of my regular business, I need you to just have a separate Aliyah list. Because as I think of things, I either need to have you know, my own little worksheet or I need you to put it in a worksheet for me so that when I say to you what are the 10 things that I forgot to do for Aliyah that I need to do she'll tell me so if you're very good with you know keeping things in order then you can do that and if you're not good with those things get somebody to support you and to help you thank you so much thank you really very exciting so if anybody has any other questions you want to uh, say you want to do it in person you're welcome I'm talking about our uh, participants, you know, they can ask if they want, they can wish if you want. If they're yeah. shy, they can also stay shy. Yes, please. Uh, it would be great to follow up with you once you move to That's Israel and uh, hear yeah. how everything went, what, uh, what worked, what didn't. Um, I follow up, hopefully. <laughs> With pleasure, with pleasure. I will come back on. I will tell you. We'll just adjust it seven hours. It could be my midnight and your afternoon, <laughs> but we'll adjust it so that it works out. Excellent. Very good. I'd love so we're you. looking forward to speak with you. Hopefully, maybe like in a couple of weeks is a possibility, or maybe three weeks yeah. on. Yes. Bedrash oh, Hashem, I'll be you... on that plane in nine days. Please, excellent, God. <laughs> excellent. Very good. So we're gonna be speaking with you soon. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. It's such thank a pleasure. You for having me. I want to welcome. Thank I want to you. thank everyone who joined us, everyone who watched, and we want to actually uh, share more joyful occasions of Aliyah with our own friends. One day, um, I want to make a, a statement, Aliza. One day, I'm going to be interviewed. Okay. <laughs> Amen. 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 Rather sooner than later. All the best to you. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.